All righty. Uh, welcome, everyone, to the podcast. Uh, today, we have a uh, special guest, Dr. Alex Whiting. Uh, Dr. Whiting is a neurosurgeon and director of epilepsy surgery for the Allegheny Health Network's Neuroscience Institute. He specializes in state-of-the-art epilepsy treatments, including stereoelectroencephalography, seizure-focused resections, laser ablations, vagal nerve stimulation, and responsive neurostimulation. Additionally, he has clinical interests in clinical uh, in complex spine and brain disorders and offers a range of surgical options and interventions for these conditions. Dr. Whiting completed his residency at the Barrow Neurological Institute in Phoenix, Arizona. He completed his fellowship in epilepsy surgery at the Cleveland Clinic in Cleveland, Ohio, and was awarded the American Epilepsy Society's prestigious Young Investigator Award. Today, today he's here to speak to us about uh, stereoelectroencephalography and minimally invasive epilepsy surgery. Thank you for joining us, Dr. Whiting. Thanks for having me. Great. So uh, again, Dr. Whiting, thanks thanks for joining us on this podcast. We're excited to have you and, and get your insights specifically on SEG, which is going to be the topic, uh, or stereo EEG, as it's sometimes called. So uh, maybe you could start, though, by taking a step back uh, and telling us you, you've been in practice now for a few years, uh, and you've been building your epilepsy practice. And, you know, we, we've published on you know, problems in underutilization of epilepsy surgery, it, it continues to be a big issue in our field. How have you uh, had success in building your own epilepsy surgical volume? Tell, tell us a little bit about that. Um, well, I think I've had the same challenges that everybody in epilepsy surgery uh, faces, which is finding the patients with medically refractory epilepsy and then convincing them that surgery is worthwhile. Um and then also convincing neurologists that what you're doing is safe and efficacious. So um, I think that's kind of been the biggest breakthrough uh, in practice for us is just building a pretty nice um, high volume SEG practice, getting that off the ground. Because I, I, I and we're going to talk about that, I think, a little bit today. But um, I, I see SEG as the gateway to a lot of other uh, epilepsy surgeries, which are really the ones that help patients. So um, I know we're going to talk a little bit more about the the risks and benefits and everything else that goes into SCG, but I have found that the, um, again, the, the big breakthrough is getting through to um, people in the community and, and neurologists and patients and, and convincing them what you're doing is is worthwhile. And it sounds like you're having, you have a low threshold for offering SEG because you find that is the way to, again, it's an invasive investigation, but uh it pays off in many cases for patients in the sense that it leads you to a definitive treatment. Um, yeah. So just in case anybody listening uh, isn't familiar, SCG is when we place electrodes into the brain, directly into the brain. Um, I, I use a robot to do that in a minimally invasive way. And, and I, I do have a very low threshold for that. And um, the neurologists we work with here also do just because we think in a lot of ways it's low hanging fruit. It gives you an incredible bounty of information um, that you can use to tailor surgery and tailor treatment, and it's incredibly safe. Um, and I don't know if you want to talk about that now or later, but um, so why don't you go ahead and in in step back one one uh, bit? So uh, historically, uh, I, I in my residency was trained using subdural grids, and what we would do is we would place a large grid array on the surface of the brain. And using these little electrodes on the grid, we would identify where the seizures are starting and be able to plan. Um, but even at that time, when we were doing subdural grids in my residency in Europe, they were, they were doing a lot of SEG. You trained at Cleveland Clinic, which is one of the highest volume SEG places in the United States. So tell us a little bit about SEG versus subdural grids, and then tell us about your own process of how you place those SEG electrodes. Um, well, so subdural grids requires a, a relatively large invasive surgery. It requires a pretty big incision, a craniotomy. Um, there's been a lot of good papers in the last couple of years comparing complication rates, and the complication rate is higher with subdural grids compared to SCG, and, and all of that is due to the invasiveness. So um, subdural grids, you're placing the grid directly onto the brain, and then you're placing depths occasionally in different places. Um SEG, you're creating a three-dimensional grid within the brain, actually in the cortex, um, and placing electrodes, usually, like we're going to talk about with a robot, in a um, minimally invasive way. So you don't need a craniotomy, you don't need a big incision. Patients are still 
feeling like themselves afterwards. I, th I think that's really the big difference. The complication profile of SEG, which is what I tell patients and neurologists when I'm out kind of pitching it, um, I say the major complication rate is one, one to 2%. And there's a lot of really good papers that, that peg it at that. Um, I, I tell people, if you look at all the papers on diagnostic angiograms, the major complication rate is one to 2%. So I see SEG almost like a diagnostic intervention, and, and that's how I talk about it to people. Um, and I think when you compare that to subdural grids and you're talking to patients and neurologists and you're showing pictures of people that still have their hair and no incisions compared to someone who has a hemicraniectomy incision like you would with a grid, um, it's a pretty easy sell. I think the information we get for the most part in most patients, and there are exceptions, is better with SEG. SCG, you're actually going into the brain. You know, you're sampling all the different regions of cortex, even the deep ones, the mesial structures. Um, that's challenging to do with subdural grid. So I, I just think SCG is, it's safer, it's less painful, it's less invasive. And I think the information is usually better. So we um, do very little subdural grids. It's almost exclusively SCG. I figured you were going to say that, yeah. And okay. Dr. Whiting, oh, uh, do you mind kind of walking us through the SEEG process from start to finish? Um, well, the biggest thing is, is talking to patients about it and explaining everything and making sure they have a good understanding with any of this. They're in the hospital a long time. Um, so we, we do all that and, and we do our due diligence and explain everything. But um, I tell everybody that that, that major complication, the chance that you're going to have a major complication that's going to change you permanently is about 1%. And that's what we expect. Um, and then once a patient is interested in proceeding with surgery, we get a very special CT angiogram study. Um, I use the ROSA robot to do my surgery. So usually when I'm doing that, and I'll talk about that in a second, but we scan the face for registration. So when we do that CTA, it's a very thin cut uh, image that has absolutely nothing on the face. It can't have anything obscuring it or moving the face anyway, because that's how we register. And then we get a thin cut MRI uh, with double contrast also to look at imaging and cortical structures. Um, we co-register those together on the ROSA robot and then plan out all our trajectories where we want to put our electrodes. As you mentioned, I trained at Cleveland Clinic, so I, I'm a subscriber to the orthogonal method, you know, um, placing your electrodes in orthogonally in kind of pre-planned stereotype fashion creating a three-dimensional grid. Um, so we plan that all out beforehand. Patient comes to the OR, goes to sleep completely. I use a, a Lexel frame just for uh, stability. I think it provides the best stability. Um, it's not a stereotactic frame in the way we're using it. And then we scan the face with a laser. We co-register it with that CTA. Um, and then we proceed to place all the electrodes. The robotic arm will drive to each electrode and then the surgeon does the work. Um, a lot of that's based on tactile feel, but each electrode is one tiny hole, two millimeters. Um, we drill right through the skin. We don't make an incision, drill through the uh, skull, place a bolt, which will hold your trajectory. And then you place your electrode right down the trajectory. And, and ultimately that's what guides it to the place you, you're hoping it'll be. Um, we usually do 12 to 16 of those per patient. It moves very quickly with the robot, um, usually from when we cut. So when we're done, it's about an hour. So everything moves very quickly. Um, we check the uh, uh, impedances and the ECOG as we go, just for, for speed. They're usually the neurologist is there checking the ECOG in the room. We check each electrode as we go. Um, and then that's it. We secure them all with the caps, hold them in place. Um, I don't know how much you guys want to go into the nuts and bolts. of what Well, comes I, I have a few questions that came up while you were going through that. So First is about the preoperative image acquisition. You said double GAD MR, right? Um, and then you said you also use a CT angiogram. Some people would argue that most of the structures that we're worried about hitting are actually veins, not arteries. So do you do something with the CT acquisition so that you, is it, is, is there something about the acquisition that you use that's different rather than a standard CT to make sure that you're seeing the venous phase as well? So that's a great point. And that's um, when I'm planning trajectories, um, I'm much more worried about being near a surface vein than I am um, skating by a sulcal artery. 
Um, because it, it does appear and seem like that once you're in the actual brain parenchyma, most of the stuff will kind of move out of the way. You obviously don't want to put a trajectory right through an artery. Um, I use that double contrast MRI for venous anatomy. I, I feel like that does a pretty good job of showing it. And usually when you go back and forth between the two, you can figure it, figure it out where they are. But I, I don't do a dedicated CTV or anything like that. Then um, the other thing you said that caught my attention is you you don't shave hair and we don't either but you drill through the skin. So tell me about how that works. Do you, do you, you have somebody, uh, again, do you ever catch the hair in the, I, I know this is a, a small point, but I'm just curious, are you catching the hair in your drill sometimes or how do you avoid that? I guess, I mean, I might have misrepresented what I said. Um, we do shave some hair. I don't shave the whole head though. So usually, I mean, most people are getting a pretty dense temporal implantation to some extent, depending on where their epilepsy is coming, but that's the vast majority of what we see. So I'll, I'll usually shave a little strip down here and then anything above superior temporal line, then, then we do just like a little shave. So I, I haven't had that problem, um, but I, I am shaving a little bit of hair around each electrode. Um, so we, we drill right down through the skin though. Um, and I find that that heals up fine. That makes sense. That makes sense. Uh, well, let me, let me ask you a few things after uh, you've placed the EEG in. First of all, tell us about what is the average amount of time somebody's in the hospital to collect information uh, and what's your range? What's the longest? What's the shortest? Um, we try to, I, and the people I think I worry about that they might end up staying a little too long are the people that have um, cyclical epilepsy the ones that are timed to menstrual cycles, you, you, you know, everybody's heard that story and everybody's seen those patients. So anybody like that, we try very hard to time it out the right way and make sure that their um, seizure would seemingly fall right in the middle of their stay. So I, we book everybody for 10 days. The vast majority of them have enough seizures and we've done stimulation, everything we need to know by about seven or eight days. So sometimes we'll, we'll explain around seven or eight, but we average, I think probably seven or eight but everybody's booked for 10. We haven't had anybody stay more than two weeks. That's the longest we've had anybody stay. We've, we've gotten seizures in everybody, so knock on wood. And, and Dr. Whiting, do you ever go back and add additional electrodes? Uh, we have in here, I wrote a paper about that when I was at Cleveland because they, they did that once or twice when I was there, and they, they've done that um, once or twice a year over the last decade or so. Um, not hard to do. We haven't had to do it yet, but every patient, when we're discussing them kind of at that midweek point, I always bring it up that if you all feel like I'm not in the right place or more electrodes would be, uh, helpful, we can do that. And, and that's not hard to do when I do it. When, when we wrote that paper up, the technique was you take them back, you basically just drape everything out, um, and prep in your area where you're going to put your electrodes and then just do it the same way. Just, just don't hit the wires. So, Alex, you said that at this point, you're essentially never using subdural grids. Um, the, the times that I will still use them is if we're nearby language cortex. And uh, again, in, in my in my hands, you know, I feel like I, I have a better sense of of understanding where language is with the grids. Tell me how you map language, how you how you're doing that with SEG. Um, so that is the patient where I think subdural grids are still very useful. Um patients where you're worried about language. So um, we haven't had anybody where we were so concerned about it that we thought we should do subdural grids. But if there was somebody just like the patient you're talking about, we would do that. Um, but we do stimulate with the SEG electrodes. And a lot of times if there's something we're worried about, like a left frontal epilepsy or uh, perirolandic, anything like that, um, we will pretty densely implant that whole region and then stimulate the electrodes. Um, and if it ablates language while they're, they're there in the, um, at bedside, we usually use that as a surrogate. That makes sense. Um, we recently, uh, I'm not sure if you've uh, have familiarity with this uh, cortical, cortical evoked potential monitoring to, to look at the arcuate fasciculus. Um, it's an interesting, we, we've used this once recently uh, here in New Jersey and uh, it, it seemed to work. We got a good signal. We were able to, you know, it, it was a case where I was not uh, so worried about being that close to language, but I thought, well, we're on the language dominant side. Let's, let's test and see. And it seems like a promising 
ideas. You know, we we operate on a lot of kids, obviously. So a weight cranny is kind of uh, out the window. So you either have to get good, uh, you know, extra operative mapping or or try, you know, cortical 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 evoked potential monitoring. Um, do you do any weight cranies, or is that something that uh, certainly you, you 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 might if you had somebody who who needed it? I yeah, exactly. Um, I've done them for gliomas, just not for epilepsy, but we would. We just haven't had that patient. Dr. Whiting, uh, do you ever use the SEG electrodes to to stimulate seizures uh, when spontaneous seizures aren't so forthcoming? Right. So um, we are still building out our kind of standard stimulation protocol. And our goal is to do that in everybody. Um, but right now we're doing it in select cases. And the neurologists are, are running the show here and they're, they're pretty good about all that. But um, we have been doing that in people where we feel like the story isn't fitting together perfectly. And then we will stimulate um, the electrodes one by one, contact by contact. Um, and the goal of hopefully stimulating a seizure and, and better elucidating that network. Um, how often are you, uh, I, I know the topic is SEG, but it spills into other topics. How often are you using laser ablation post SEG and how often are you, uh, taking patients for an RNS or a neuropace, uh, neuromodulation implant after SEG or, or DBS? Uh, Cause I know you guys are a very uh, busy DBS program too. Um, we don't do a ton of DBS for epilepsy. That, that's one thing we don't do a lot of, um, I am definitely a subscriber to the resective surgery is our goal um, in a lot of ways. And um, I think if you can find a safe area of the brain that you feel like you can take out without causing significant clinical problems or, or changing the patient in any way that's going to be significant, and that's where your um, network seems to be arising from, that's best case scenario. And, and I tell everybody that's our goal. Our goal is to find a surgery where I can take a piece out and hopefully fix this thing. Um, but in other cases, and, and we have a lot of patients that have had epilepsy a long time, a lot of patients with bitemporal epilepsy, um, RNS is a fantastic option. Um, the uh, We have done some laser ablation. My, my, my feelings on laser ablation is a lot of times it's a tiny hole for a big problem. Um, so every now and then, We've had one or two patients where we had a very dense SCG implantation. So we did not feel like we were missing anything. And they had a very focal onset. And those patients, we we have talked about it, uh, laser ablation. And one of them, we did it. And, and they did well. Um, that's the patient I see as a good laser candidate. Um, or maybe a left temporal patient that doesn't want to do a left temporal lobectomy. I think laser comes into play then. Um RNS, 100%. If the patient doesn't have an appetite for a deficit and it's left-sided, I think we, we jump to it pretty quickly here. Um, functional patients, working patients, things like that with a left temporal epilepsy, when we map it to that left hippocampus, if, if we think that's important, then we, we go to RNS. So we, we do a good bit of RNS. And those patients have done really well. I mean, I, I don't know what your experience has been, but it feels like the bitemporal patients do uh, stupendously. Um, so we've been doing that a lot more too. Yeah, well, and I, I agree with your first point very much, especially, uh, you know, again, I am operating on a lot of children. Um, obviously, RNS has a role, uh, but I think if uh, most children, you, you can you can find a resective strategy. And if you can, that, that should definitely be uh, considered first. Um, talk a, li uh, a little bit about uh, insular electrodes, because insular electrodes, I think, you know, they, they bring up a lot of controversy. Uh, the insula, for those who don't know, is this um, uh, deep lobe in the brain, and it's covered by vessels. And so it's, it's a riskier place to place electrodes, perhaps, and it's, it certainly requires some more uh, thought. T tell me about how you sample the insula. I mean, I, I think know, since you're from Cleveland Clinic. I think I know because I've been to your course, but <laughs> um, well, I think um, when you're doing SCG, the whole point is that you should be putting in enough electrodes that you're going to find what you're looking for, but you're going to rule out any imitators. And the insula obviously is a, is a great imitator in a lot of ways of um, semiology of different kinds of epilepsy. So Almost all of our patients get at least some insular coverage, if not to better understand the network. Um, 
certainly to rule out an insular epilepsy or just to define how big of a network we're talking about. Um, so pretty much everybody we put electrodes in has some insular coverage. I will put those in. I, I'm not dogmatic about that. I, I bet you thought I was going to be just because of where I came from, but I'm not tremendously dogmatic about it. Um, I'll take what the brain gives you and I, I will go through the operculum. So traditionally, the way I was trained was you get to the insula um, by doing orthogonal trajectories through either the frontal or temporal, temporal operculum. Um, and you just come right in, um, straight in. And that is a safe technique. Some people don't have the correct anatomy for that. I have found that oblique electrodes are much better at sampling the insula because you're coming down the barrel of it. So usually if I'm trying to sample the anterior insula, you're going to get one of those frontal electrodes that's, that comes back um, along the um, short gyri. And then if you're sampling the posterior insula, um, you're going to come kind of along the, the uh, barrel of the long gyri from the back. That's how I've found to be the most effective. Almost everybody gets an anterior insular electrode in our implantations because we're looking at a lot of frontotemporal epilepsy in adults. Interesting. And, and, and Dr. Whiting, um, so, you know, just talking about your, your selection of targets, um, how much of the decision is based on um, semiology and how much of the decision is based on just using predetermined targets? Um, well, everybody we implant, I sit down with whoever their epileptologist is that's going to be running the show. Um, and I've given them all kind of the menu of different options many times. And, and they'll tell me what they think is important, what's not important. Um, but we do do things in a, a relatively stereotyped way. And a lot of that is following the Cleveland Clinic model of implantation strategies. Um, so for instance, if you have presumed temporal epilepsy, if you're getting a, uh, an SEG phase two evaluation, it means we're, we're not positive where it's coming from or how big your network is. So that means um, orbital frontal cortex, that means anterior insula, that means um, anorhinal cortex. It, it, we do have a definitely a stereotype kind of way we think about things. And a lot of that is just based on where is this going to be spreading to if I want to understand the network. Um, and then also to rule out imitators, um, cingulate, that, that's going to be in there. So that, that's what we do usually. Yeah, that's interesting. I, you know, just, I'm thinking a little bit about the differences between adults and children and a lot of my SEG cases end up resulting in multi-lobar disconnections, you know, posterior quadrant disconnections or anterior quadrant disconnections. And uh, probably, um, again, in the adult population, a lot of your SE, as you mentioned, a lot of them are, are in the temporal region, temporal plus kind of epilepsies. And so you're, you're interested in the temporal lobe, you're interested in the insula, certainly orbital frontal cortices, operculum. But um I, I find that, uh, I you know, we, we're asking this question about placement of electrodes because I, I know semiology obviously has been a, a big role uh, in the Cleveland Clinic talks a lot about uh, how important semiology has been in there thinking about where they place electrodes. But I, I sometimes think surgeons approach this uh, a little bit differently where certainly the semiology is important, but we're also thinking about what surgeries we have to offer. You know, like you said, what's on the menu in terms of, okay, well, this implant could lead to a posterior quadrant disconnection, in which case we want to make sure we we have coverage of the posterior quadrant, but also some sampling of the frontal lobe more to rule it out than, than to necessarily, um, <clears throat> than to have a, a really dense array in that area. So there's some of that in pediatric uh, SEG, but it's interesting, you know, I think all of us are, are sort of learning as we go along. And I certainly think uh, there's a lot of that in, in our group. To, so last question for you today, tell us, what do you think epilepsy surgery is going to look like in the next 20 years? What what are going to be our um, biggest challenges as surgeons, as epileptologists sort of offering um, treatments to patients? And, and w w what do you think are some things that are on the brink of sort of being innovations or what, what are things on the horizon? Um. Well, just to um, echo what you said a minute ago, I think that is a fantastic point. I wish I had said it. I think um, when you're talking about planning out where your electrodes are going, that's the surgeon's job is to kind of let the neurologist know the next two or three steps and why um, 
basically how you do your implantation is going to lead to what you do next. So, I mean, just like you said, we're talking about boundaries of resection. So that that's ultimately, we think that way. Anatomically, where am I going to stop? But even just in terms of risk, every electrode, while the risk is low, is not zero. So each additional electrode I put in your head, I'm, I'm putting you through just a little bit more risk. So sometimes when we have a patient that, like, let's say has right temporal epilepsy and they've had a long time and they want to know, do they have bitemporal or can we do a temporal lobectomy? Let's better understand this network. And you'll come with this giant implantation strategy on both sides. And you say, well, what if we put 100 electrodes on the left side, what is that going to change? That's not like we should put just a couple electrodes on the left side. All this is going to do is basically put this patient in the RNS camp. And I think that's our job um, in a lot of ways when we're planning. And then to answer your second question, just the, the future of epilepsy, um, I think uh, neuromodulation is going to be front and center. I think epilepsy networks and, and modulating epilepsy networks is really kind of going to be what we're heading towards with neuromodulation. I mean, right now, we the RNS has been a game changer for a lot of patients and, and definitely clinicians, but it's a pretty simple tool. I mean, you're talking about two two electrodes or two paddles. Um, imagine what you could do with quite a few of those, right? If you're talking about epilepsy networks. So I think um, there might be a time when people look back and say, I can't believe they cut giant holes out of people's brains. I don't, I don't think that's going to happen in the next 20 years, but it's probably not that far away. Um, I'm very excited about that. I think that's been a hard thing for a lot of surgeons is, is getting away from cutting holes and, and thinking about, you know, maybe there's a better option for some patients. You got to take in their whole kind of quality of life and what their goals are. And, and that's what neuromodulation does. So for me, the future in a lot of ways is figuring out how we fit in with neuromodulation um, and where it goes from here. You are right on some level. What we do is a bit uh, simplistic and almost barbaric. Uh, it it does work well, uh, and I think we you know we 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 do it safely and and it works well. But you're right, you're right. I think the future is probably less resection and more neuromodulation, and that's um, that's certainly something to look forward to uh, and for our patients as well. Listen, uh, Alex, thank you so much for joining us, and um, uh, it's it's really again great to hear from an expert in SEG who's now uh, started started a great program and doing a lot of this work. And uh, look forward to talking to you more in the future. Thanks for having me. This is great. Okay. Take care, Alex. Bye-bye. Thank you for listening to the Epilepsy Podcast. The video content and audio content is not intended to be a substitute for professional medical advice. Uh, the views and opinions represented here are merely the views and opinions of our expert guests. Thank you.